Hi, this is Lindsay Luther, uh, Assistant Professor with the Mount Carmel College of Nursing in the Family Nurse Practitioner Program. This presentation is entitled Care of the Transgender Patient by, uh, in Primary Care. I want you to just take a quick look at this area up at the top of the screen where you see this um, little notice about the microphone icon and being able to click on it in order to hear the audio on each slide. I've actually disabled that audio and it'll probably be removed from your own slides by the time you look at this, so you can just ignore that. Um, to listen, you'll just hear me speak uh, through the video. Okay, so the first thing I want you to do is really think about what you bring to this environment with your patients. So starting with yourself, there are going to be a lot of times in your career that you feel in, uncomfortable interacting with a patient. And this is one area in which people feel uncomfortable. So my best advice before you watch this presentation at all is to really consider the topic of transgender and think about whether or not you have any uh, prior experiences with this or if you have any um, feelings or in particularly strong period feelings in any directions about this topic. I have had the opportunity to work with transgender patients both in my routine practice um, as an NP at the hospital, but I've also had some uh, experience with this working in an endocrinology clinic for patients who were in the transition period um, when I was actually in nurse practitioner school. And so even despite my own experience, sometimes I still feel a little bit of discomfort and a lack of confidence with saying the right thing um, with these individuals. And so I think that on its own is one of the reasons that providers may feel uncomfortable talking about this. Um, on this slide you see there's a lot of other reasons that you may feel uncomfortable as well. So one thing that I think you can do when you're working with trans patients is to understand the terminology that is used. There are some words that you should feel comfortable using and then there are some words that you want to avoid because they have historical contexts which create stigma. Many of the terms that are preferred by the trans community are included on this slide and I would familiarize yourself with them and I will be using some of them during the presentation so you can refer back to them. When you're thinking about gender, it's important to remember that gender is not only binary selection um, of male or female, and instead you might choose to think of gender as a continuum upon which people exist in varying degrees of masculinity and femininity. And then keep in mind that masculinity and feminin femininity are defined differently in different cultures. And so much of this uh, is relatively arbitrary. So for example, in American culture, for whatever reason, baby boys wear blue and baby girls wear pink. Um, in other cultures, pink may be more commonly associated with male gender. So the second slide is a set of uh, gender-related terms that tend to be used more um, in formal environments. Um, and these are the ones that you may see written in the medical literature or in the medical record. So you may want to familiarize yourself with these as well. Okay, so just this is one more depiction of the fluidity of gender, and this is called the gender-bred person, or the, uh, it has other names, but um, this drawing basically helps to distinguish the, the various continuums that, that individual persons may exist on, um, and so they're not mutually exclusive. Somebody can be genderqueer, but have their gender expression be more feminine, their biologic sex could be male, their sexual orientation could be heterosexual or homosexual. None of these things are mutually exclusive. This, the transgender population has a number of health disparities. Um, about 0.6% of the American population self-identifies as transgender. Of these persons, about 41% of them report a history of attempted suicide, which is in comparison to 1.6% of Americans. So hugely high suicide rates. Um, individuals who identify as transgender also have higher rates of HIV and STIs, higher rates of substance abuse and comorbid psychiatric disorders. Um, there's a high incidence of homelessness and victimization and discrimination. So 
we need to be focusing in on these persons because they are at additional risks when compared to the general American population. There are also a number of barriers to health care which help to per, uh, continue to increase these health disparities. Transgender individuals may be reluctant to disclose their status to providers, including PCPs, pharmacists, and lab personnel. Inexperienced providers make assumptions that reduce the patient's experience or of uh, their quality of care. And then financial barriers, including a lack of health insurance or misgendered health insurance, limits for the number of mental health visits that these persons can have, um, or the extraordinary cost of some of these specific surgeries and treatments um, can be prohibitive for patients. Additional structural barriers that patients encounter may include unisex or a lack of unisex bathrooms, so male or female bathrooms only, fem uh, women or men's rooms, inpatient room assignments, which are based on gender, documentation system problems, so the inability for an established patient's gender designation to change within the medical record, or an inability to explain within the medical documentation system that the patient's gender assignment does not match the body parts that they have, or inappropriate lab reference ranges. So some of our lab values are determined based, uh, the normals for our lab values are determined based on male or female biologic sex. Healthcare providers can help to make their uh, offices more welcoming by posting LGBT friendly signs or rainbow flags by creating unisex bathrooms. You might consider putting out LGBT specific patient information, especially those that include diverse de depictions of individuals in their families, so multiracial, multi ethnic, multicultural, and then also posting visible non discrimination policies to set an environment where that is the understanding that these all persons are welcome. And finally, creating referral programs with local LGBT and HIV advocacy programs can help to bridge this gap. One question that has been asked repeatedly throughout the history of medicine is whether or not transgender is considered a medical disorder. So transgender is not a medical disorder. It's a qualitative descriptor. It is not a medical diagnosis. But keep in mind that healthcare is not insulated from the larger culture. So in the DSM-5, there is a codable diagnosis for a mismatch of the person's gender identity from the person's uh, sex assigned at birth. And this codable diagnosis was changed between the DSM-4 and the DSM-5 from gender identity disorder, which suggested that the person had a disease to gender dysphoria in the DSM-5, which only suggests that the person has distress caused by this mismatch of gender from the assigned sex. Um, this all needs to be distinguished from gender nonconformity, in which the person may not conform to the sex assigned at birth, but in whom this is not significantly stressful. So gender nonconformity is not a diagnosis. It's a descriptor for those who do not conform to their assigned gender, but in whom this is not significantly stressful. Gender affirming therapy um, is the process of allowing the person's outward expression to match their the gender that they feel on the inside. So this can involve several things. Um, it can involve a change in disclosure, so the preferred name or pronoun. Um, it can involve legal changes, so changing things like a birth certificate, medical records, um, financial records, home ownership, things like that. Uh, it may also involve changes to the body, so um, use of medications like hormone therapies and surgery. According to the 2015 U.S. Transgender Surgery, nearly 80% of respondents were interested in eventually trying some form of medical therapy um, for gender dysphoria. And this is easier to do for individuals who have not undergone puberty because they'll have faster responses and more dramatic results with the use of hormones. Hormones can be used to alter the shape of the face, uh, face and torso uh, soft tissues, the breast tissue, genital size and shape, but they cannot 
they cannot change bone structure with hormones. And as in all areas, um, genetic variations are going to play a, a role in um, the results that are achieved with hormones. There used to be a lot more requirements for having gender affirming therapy, medically speaking. So there were some requirements, including a real life experience, which was when the person was basically forced to function within the new gender identity for a certain period of time, live that identity in their day-to-day -day life. But these experiences were found to be impractical and they actually increased distress um, and suicidality and they had potentially negative consequences. So for example, if the person has been working as a man um, for the past you know, 12 years at a certain job and the next day, in order to fulfill this real life experience, they show up to that same job dressed as a woman that is in many ways um, not the way that the person would choose to transition. Uh, but because they need to meet these requirements, they, they were kind of forced to do it in a less gradual manner in order to get credit for doing it. There also used to be a component of psychological clearance, which was required even as few as um, six or seven years ago when I was going through my NP training. And we kind of know now that behavioral health support is really helpful to patients, but it's not necessary for all people. So now we use a model called the informed consent model, which basically just requires that the person understand what is going to happen with the use of these hormones and or surgery and that they document the, their, this understanding and a willingness to proceed. And um, this can be accomplished as far as medical reimbursement by, di by diagnosing the patient with persistent gender dysphoria. Um, and using that as the billable code for these therapies. And then the patient needs to have well-controlled medical comorbidities in order to pursue uh, hormone therapy and surgery. They need to be in good enough shape to have those things. Gender-affirming therapy can take anywhere for three to six months for the initial results of hormones to work, but they may, um, individuals may notice continued changes over a course of up to three years. Some of these changes are permanent and others are not permanent. Um, some features require surgery or cosmetic um, things like uh, filler injections or Botox in order to be um, more effective. And how well therapies work depend on a few things. One is whether or not the patient has undergone puberty at this point. The second is the patient's bone structure. That bone structure is not going to change. What we can change is the amount of fatty tissue and soft tissue on top of the bone structure, but there's still going to be some limitations based on the patient's underlying um, bone makeup. And then genetic variations also make a difference. Biologic sex makes a difference. So in some of these transitions will be a little bit easier than others, depending on whether the patient's trying to tr uh, transition from male to female or female to male. Okay, so when you have a patient who wants to start hormone therapy, the first thing that you need to do is a history and physical. So basically you need to have a very good medical workup of this patient. This should include a urogynecological exam and any of the appropriate cancer or sexually transmitted infection screenings that you would include for a patient of, um, of this age bracket and risk bracket. And then you, so those STI screenings should be appropriate to the sexual activity of the patient. Um, a psychologic evaluation should consider whether there are any comorbid psychologic disorders. And then there, you also want to look for any comorbid um, non-psychologic conditions, particularly related to cardiovascular problems, pregnancy, or hormone-sensitive cancers. Uh, substance abuse is a really big one, especially tobacco. Almost all transgender patients are smokers, um, which is a fact, not a, a judgment in any way. <laughs> and then um, you also need to pay attention to prior hormone use because a lot of these patients will have had access to hormones um, either via social circles or they may have tried prescription hormones from another provider in the past, and it's important to get that information. Sexual history is important not only to evaluate uh, risks 
but also to make sure that you can prioritize the patient's need for future sexual encounters. So um, when you're talking about sex amongst people who have who fall on the gender non-conforming spectrum, the thing that you want to pay attention to is actual body parts. So what body parts do you use for sex? What body parts do your partners have? And then you can kind of go from there in terms of uh, discussing risk. So and that kind of really helps to to get past all those different continuums that you are thinking about simultaneously as far as sexuality. Family history, you're looking for reproductive cancers and cardiovascular risk factors. Uh, one more comment just about smoking. The reason that we care about smoking is because, especially with estrogen therapy, we need to be really careful that we're not putting smokers on estrogen therapy. I, don't, I didn't mention that before. Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna look at is how ready is this patient to transition? Um, does this patient have psychosocial support? Do they have economic and insurance resources? Is their home environment stable? Uh, the, the impact of homelessness on the trans community is, is very huge, and sometimes the process of transition is that moment when the patient becomes uh, less stable in their social and home environment and work environments as well. That can be a trigger for instability. So we want to make sure that we have them in a good place that they can do this safely. And then you always need to make sure that the patient understands the way that the hormones are going to impact future fertility and to make sure that, you, um, that you're taking steps to bank sperm or eggs if that's what the patient chooses to do. If you're uncomfortable assessing a patient for readiness, you can. It's totally reasonable to refer the patient to behavioral health, um, but the patient needs to understand that you're not doing that in order to gatekeep. The, the goal is to create a team that is providing optimal care to the patient. And just remember that you're trying to reduce barriers as much as possible. So if the patient's going to see this readiness assessment as a barrier, then perhaps you can try to figure out how to reduce that impact of that barrier. All right, so lab testing. There are a couple um, lab tests that might be helpful. Fasting lipids, glucose, hemoglobin A1C, and a complete metabolic profile can be really helpful just to look at cardiovascular status and metabolic status. A pregnancy test for any um, person with a uterus is a helpful test to make sure you don't want to start hormones on somebody who could be pregnant, um, especially if, so when I say anyone with a uterus, anybody who's at risk of pregnancy. So that means if the patient has a uterus and is having um, vaginal intercourse with uh, somebody who has a penis, then they need to be tested for pregnancy. And I want you to get into the habit of thinking about it that way. We're not talking about men and women, we're talking about if the person has a uterus and has sex with someone who has a penis. Okay, so hormone levels, you want to check baseline levels for estradiol, testosterone, prolactin, and LH. You can do a pap smear um, or HPV testing if the patient has a cervix and that's indicated. Uh, you can consider STI testing if that's indicated. And if the patient is at risk for sleep apnea, you might consider sleep apnea screening. If you are, so some labs have gender-specific values, such as lipid profiles, cardiac markers, and li liver enzymes. And so if the patient is on hormone therapy already, you may need to consult an endocrinologist to figure out at what point during the hormone therapy that person should start using alternative reference ranges for the labs. So how much hormones, how long into their hormone um, transition do they need to switch to the male versus female uh, baseline levels? Okay, so if the patient was a female at birth transitioning to male, um, there's a couple things that you need to do. First goal is to reduce female secondary sex characteristics. And this is actually gonna happen on its own as the testosterone level increases. So we don't need to block estrogen. But what we do need to do is induce the male secondary sex characteristics. And this requires supplementation of testosterone. Testosterone can either be given orally, transdermally, or parentally, so via injection. And the goal will be to get the total testosterone level between 300 and 1,000, which is equivalent to the male, the normal level for an adult male. 
You can expect some changes or side effects, um, including skin oiliness, acne, facial, body hair growth, fat redistribution. Menstruation should stop. Clitoral enlargement will occur and vaginal atrophy will occur and the voice will deepen. In a patient who was born male and is transitioning to female, um, you have to do two processes in order to uh, achieve the reduction of male secondary sex characteristics and the induction of female secondary sex characteristics. So in order to make the male characteristics stop, uh, this requires an anti-androgen medication and typically we use spironolactone, which is an oral medication given daily, or you can use a GnRH agonist, which is sub-Q and given monthly. Female secondary sex characteristics can be induced with estrogen supplementation, and there are multiple forms of that. So we expect that in this patient, body fat will redistribute, muscle mass, uh, and muscle mass will decrease, the skin will soften, sexual desire will decrease due to the lack of testosterone. Um, there will be less spontaneous erection. There will be an increase in breast growth. The testicular volume and sperm production will cease body hair will reduce and male pattern baldness uh, will reduce. The voice, however, will not change. The only way to change the voice is to be, uh, is to do speech therapy. Facial hair will require additional treatments like laser hair removal. The Adam's apple is not going to change in size. The cartilage will not decrease in size and neither does the bone structure. And obviously the bone structure of the face and the rest of the body will not change. All right, so follow-up for hormone therapy. Um, the levels should be checked monthly until you find the appropriate dose, and then every three to four years, you're kind of going to repeat that history and physical and check some key lab values to, for make sure that the patient's not becoming diabetic and that their liver function's uh, maintaining appropriately and lipids are okay. After that first year, you can monitor every six to 12 months. Um, after that, these patients are very similar to the way that you monitor other patients. Just remember that you need to continue screening them for all of the body part specific conditions that they uh, may have, and then you need to continue to provide social, psychosocial support and referrals as needed. Okay, so gender reassignment surgery is a big topic and we're just going to touch on it a little bit. There are several procedures which may be included in each of these categories. And I've listed some of the procedures that an individual may have based on the objective that they're trying to achieve. There is not a lot of data regarding which, how many patients ultimately have gender reassignment surgery, but it's estimated that at any given time, about a quarter of people who identify as trans have had at least one procedure. Most commonly, the procedure is a bilateral mastectomy. Surgery tends to occur later in the transition process, and there's still some gatekeeping that keeps patients from having surgery. So for example, some surgeons require the patient to live as the desired gender for a year before committing to surgery. Studies have shown that patients tend to be highly satisfied with surgery. Most um, satisfaction scores are in the 90 to 95 percent range, and those who are dissatisfied with surgery tend to be dissatisfied due to the surgical complications. Those complications tend to be similar for these types of procedures as they are for the general population, so things like uh, venous thromboembolism, hematoma, seroma, infection, wound dehiscence, and poor healing. The nurse practitioner should be alert to the possibility of these complications following surgery, should be assessing for them in these patients, and then treating them accordingly. The complication rate is about the same as it is for general surgery, and it's 6%. Uh, facial feminization surgery can actually include dozens of surgeries. So there's everything from rhinoplasty, cheek augmentation, lip enhancement, uh, removal of the Adam's apple. Some people may undergo liposuction or fat redistribution. Some plastic surgeons will offer packages of procedures for transgender patients. And the most important thing is that the surgeon needs to have experience with whichever procedures they are providing, and they should have specialized tr uh, training in order to perform these. 
Sometimes insurance covers for some or all of these procedures and there may be financing available for patients. And then keep in mind that some patients may choose not to have surgery and may be perfectly comfortable with their bodies. And so you need to check with patients and not assume that surgery is the end goal. The cost of transition can be extraordinarily expensive. Some sources cite the cost of transi uh, transition to be up to $100,000. Prior to some of the changes in the clinical guidelines and the gatekeeping practices in the past few years, surgeries were primarily performed in Thailand, uh, which was the premier country for these procedures and had packages available for flights, housing, surgery, recovery care at a whole cost of about ten dollars to $20,000. Some patients still choose to go to other countries to have these procedures, and so you need to be aware of the travel-related risks and the um, surgical risks associated with um, uh, surgical care in other countries. Okay, so transgender patients, just like regular patients, need routine screenings, but you have to keep in mind that they have increased risks of certain conditions. So. Transgender patients have higher rates of smoking, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and these all increase after the use of hormones. Cardiovascular disease is likely increased by hormones, but it's unclear whether or not this is true specifically for the trans population or if this is just a true statement about hormone treatment in general. Feminizing hormones can increase the risk of breast cancer, but there's not enough data to predict how much. And so it's reasonable to discuss breast cancer screening um, in any male to female patient over the age of 50 who's been on long-term estrogen therapy and has additional risk factors. So for example, a high BMI. There is a risk of false positive screening with um, mammograms. And so in any patient who, has, who is natally female who still has breasts should be screened at the same schedule as that schedule which is recommended for uh, women. Okay, so what are you going to do as the NP? So really, you can prescribe hormone replacement as long as you follow the prescribing laws for the state of Ohio. Do not exceed the prescriptive authority of the collaborating physician with whom you work. And as long as you are educated enough to do so responsibly, recognize the risks, and are performing all of the necessary documentation in order to do so. It's I would suggest that if this is not something that your collaborating physician does routinely, that you instead create a multidisciplinary team in order to meet patient's needs. So if your practice does not do hormones, then you need to have an endocrinologist who you feel comfortable referring these patients to. It's also helpful if you can have contacts within plastic surgery, behavioral medicine, and speech therapy, especially if you see a large number of these patients. If this is something that you would like to pursue, it's certainly something that you can get additional training on, um, and, and there's no reason that you can't be the driving force that helps your practice to take on patients like this. So special population-wise, um, what do you do if a child or teen comes to your clinic and has questions about gender? So most children are aware of their, the gender that they were assigned at birth by the age of two, and they can recognize and use gendered proton, pronouns, him, her, he, she, by the ages of two to four. By five to six, children have usually declared a gender identity, but they still explore what that means. So they may experiment with their clothing, with their mannerisms, with um, activities that are considered gender within the culture. Gender nonconformance is very prevalent in childhood, but um, amongst all people who, who display this in childhood, about 85% of people eventually identify with the sex that they are assigned at birth. There, there is a small group of people um, who, about 15%, <laughs> who go on to um, identify as either bisexual, homosexual, transgender, or gender queer. And many of these individuals, many of that 15% of people who don't identify with the sex assigned at birth, were experimenting with gender nonconformation in childhood. So they didn't conform to the gender they were assigned at birth in childhood, and they still don't as an adult. So one of the things that's been shown to predict gender identity is I am a woman or I am a girl, I am a boy versus I feel like a girl, I feel like a boy, I feel like whatever. So um, 
if those two feelings don't if the person if the child is saying I am a boy but I feel like a girl the the f they are more likely to um, continue to identify as transgender in adulthood although this is not like every child who says this is ultimately decides um, that that's their path so gender identity develops more concretely at puberty and when a patient comes to you and says that they're interested in some information about uh, transition there's really three approaches that have been used historically to um, discuss this with children. One is the corrective approach. Um, as you can imagine, the corrective approach encourages the child to conform to the gender they were assigned at birth. And um, an alternative is the supportive approach, which doesn't really discourage the behavior, um, but it doesn't really encourage it either. And the idea is that if we don't provide any input, then we can wait and see what happens on its own. The preferred approach that has been shown to be um, the most uh, helpful approach for this population is the affirming approach, which seeks to teach children and families that gender is fluid and allows for continual decision making, regardless of whether the child, child's nonconformity ends up being persistent or not as they approach adulthood. So. Um, this approach has been shown to reduce depression, stress, suicidality, homelessness, and negative outcomes. And it's been shown to improve self-esteem, social support, mental health, and satisfaction. Basically, the idea being whatever you are is okay, and whatever you will be in the future is okay. And we'll just, you know, help you to be who you are right now. Okay, so how... When and how is transition affected in children? So gender aff affirming therapy can be offered whenever the patient crosses over from gender nonconformity to, um, to having significant stress, distress from gender dysphoria. Typically that will occur before puberty. So we're talking about uh, children who are 9, 10, 11 years old are already pretty sure that they are transgender. So there are some medications that we can give at, to children at this age, starting as early as Tanner stage two or three, that can suppress sex hormone production by the pituitary and actually prevent development. This is a preferred approach if you can catch a child um, before they enter into adolescence because it allow first of all it's reversible so if the child ultimately decides that that's not the path for them you can go backwards and it's considered safe this process can help prevent the significant stress that comes with puberty so many of these children are anticipating and agonizing over the fact that they are about to start puberty and be affirmed by their bodies into this gender that they don't foresee themselves as so this can kind of put a hold on that and hopefully prevent that uh, secondary sexual development and hopefully prevent them from needing surgery. And really this approach using these GNRH agonists buys us some time um, to, to really th have time to uh, navigate the system and come up with a plan for hormone therapy in the future if that's the route that the family chooses to go. So once a child is 16 or over, and perhaps earlier, depending on the clinician, hormone therapy begins to become an option. So the Endocrine Society recommends avoiding sex hormones until the age of 16, but there are institutions um, in the United States which will start earlier for children who meet certain criteria. And um, the Endocrine Society recommends that all adolescents be treated as individuals. Treatment with GNRH agonists or with hormone therapy requires parental consent and may require special documentation from the healthcare provider. The GNRH, although it's reversible and safe, it, it does have some drawbacks. So typically this is related to bone density changes, which might be reversible. It can decrease the amount of growth velocity or impact brain development um, by suppressing hormones. But again, that's reversible once these drugs are ceased. And the major downside is that these drugs are really expensive. So Lupron costs anywhere from 800 to 1500 a month. Histrelin is delivered via an implanted device and that can cost up to 
So, okay, so I realized that this was kind of the very quick overview of managing transgender patients. So I wanted to offer you 10 tips for success. So if you don't remember anything else from this whole presentation, this is what I want you to remember. Number one is to treat trans people like people. They're still just people who want to be um, patient-centered and have their care be tailored to them. The whole purpose of taking care of patients is to make sure that the patient is taken care of. And so it's not about you, it's about the person that you're taking care of. Second, don't assume anything. Don't assume that surgery is the goal and don't assume that you know the patient's preferences. Which leads us to number three, which is to use preferred names and pronouns even when you're referring to the patient's past. So if you're talking about um, Joe, whose name used to be Joanna before uh, he transitioned from female to male, then it's appropriate to keep talking about the patient as a male and to use the name Joe even when you're talking about what was happening 10 years ago. Because in their head they were always Joe and they were always a male and that going back to their old pronouns and names is, is not helpful. You want to make sure that your office staff is well educated um, and that your forms fit your patient. So starting with scheduling appointments and in the waiting room, you might have your staff call patients by their last name or by their preferred name instead of calling patients by Mr. or Mrs. The forms that you have the patient fill out when they're giving their history should include a blank space for the gender instead of male, female, or perhaps you might choose a, a wider list of uh, um, selections. And the form should include uh, multiple options for relationship status, such as partner instead of just spouse or divorce, married, divorced, whatever. You can use a blank box for gender, um, so instead of just using things like male and female. When asking about sexual activity, you shouldn't ask things like, do you have sex with men, women, or both? And instead, you could ask in, um, about what gender the person has sex with and what body parts are involved and what body parts are touching other people's body parts. So, for example, do you have sex with people who have penises? And if the answer is yes, do you have oral, vaginal, or anal penetration? You need to get used to using these words. Get used to naming body parts. Number seven, recognize that gender identity and sexuality are different um, and that they may not line up the way that you expect them to in every case. If you make a mistake, if you say something wrong or inappropriate, just acknowledge your mistake, apologize, and move on. You don't need to keep dwelling on it, and if you do, you're putting the onus on your patient to feel bad for you instead of letting the focus be on the patient. Don't forget that the that proper health care is going to require you to acknowledge both the gender identity and the biologic sex. So it's not enough to just say this patient identifies as male. As a healthcare provider, you need to take care of the physical body that that patient has. And that physical body may include male and female parts, um, or may include neither. And so you need to be aware of um, both things simultaneously. And then finally, Recognize that trans and LGBT patients may have a, have a history of traumatic medical experiences in the past. You don't want to be another one of these traumatic experiences and you really um, want to create a safe space and protect the confidentiality and the status of these patients. You want them to come back to you so that they can get good quality health care. And then finally, I wanted to just draw your attention to some resources that might be useful to you. Um, we have a number of great resources in Columbus, and um, one that I wanted to point out is Nationwide Children's Thrive Program, which is a program for children with differences and disorders of sexual development and complex genitourinary conditions. So this group actually includes children with complex needs, even including things like urostomies or ambiguous genitalia or endocrine disorders, which cause delayed sexual maturation. But uh, for children, this can also be a, a useful program for those who identify as transgender. So again, as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Um, and I will post these notes for you so that you can review them and you can review some of my commentary in written format on our site. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it.